Okay, so let's start. A uh, very good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to this panel discussion tonight. Uh, this panel is part of the Asia Europe Cultural Festival, uh, a festival organized by ASEF uh, Cultural Department. And this year, um, we presented five events, and this is the last event, uh, so our closing event for, for the year. Uh, my name is Valentina Riccardi, and I'm the director of the culture department, and I work with my colleagues who are here, uh, Julia, Karin, and Tika, who are also helping uh, organize this event tonight. Uh, before we go into the discussion, I just wanted to say a few words about ASEF for those who maybe are not familiar with our uh, organization. We've been based in Singapore since 1997, and we are an intergovernmental organization uh, funded by government of Asia and Europe to create cooperation in a number of thematic areas, uh, culture, education, government, governance, sustainability, and media. Uh, tonight, I'm very pleased to present our speakers and to start a conversation titled Framing the Future, Photography's Impact on Climate Change, uh, Climate Awareness in Southeast Asia. Um, we are delighted to work with the Embassy of the Netherlands in Vietnam and the Noor Foundation in the Netherlands for this event. In fact, as you will hear from some of our speakers tonight, this talk is also a way to present to a wider community the result of a residency program for photojournalists that has been developed in Hanoi, Vietnam in the last Recording in months. progress. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, you will hear from some of our speakers about um, the residency program that was developed on uh, journalism and climate change. Uh, before we go into the conversation, uh, just a few tech, um, practical things to share. As I mentioned, the event is a hybrid event, so we have uh, people uh, joining in on YouTube, on Facebook, and so maybe we'll take some questions later also from there, and then all of you coming here together uh, in this room, in this lovely, very nice space, I would say. <laughs> so thank you again for uh, taking the time to come all the way here. Um, we, we will have uh, maybe like a 45 minutes conversation with our speakers, and then we will take some questions both from the floor here and then from uh, people who are online. And then after that, we'll have a small cocktail reception, and we hope that you, know, you can stay and then maybe continue the conversation with our uh, speakers here. So um, let me introduce them. Uh, I won't go into their full bios because I know that they have been shared with all of you, so we have more time to uh, speak with them. Uh, next to me, I have Lin Pham from Vietnam. Lin is a photographer and has been a facilitator of the Noor Visualizing Climate Crisis uh, Mentoring Program. Thank you, Lin, for being here tonight. Uh, we have then Chitrapong Kaimon, Kaikom sorry, from Thailand. Chitrapong is a photographer and one of the participants of the residency pro program. Same as Ponita. Hi, Ponita. Ponita is from Cambodia, and she also is a photographer, a visual artist, and has participated into the program uh, developed by Noor. And then we have uh, two gentlemen, Dr. Matthias Roth from NUS. Matthias is a professor of urban climatology of the Department of Geography at the National University of Singapore. And David Fogarty, a journalist and head of the climate change uh, uh, desk at the Straits Time here in Singapore. We are really pleased to have all of you here and to be able to connect uh, different kind of people working around climate change and using the means of photography to raise awareness in that sense. Um, maybe a few words about the topic itself. Uh, well, all of you are aware that Climate change is a climate crisis, I would say. Oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce Stefano. Oops, my bad. Stefano, very sorry. <laughs> uh, Stefano is with us online. No problem. Sorry, Stefano. Uh, Stefano Carini, no artistic, uh, sorry, um, um, creative director of the Noor Foundation. Stefano is joining us from Torino in Italy. Uh, hi, Stefano. <laughs> Thank you for Hello. joining us tonight. And sorry for forgetting you <laughs> in the middle of the whole... <laughs> 
hybrid Thank you for having me. mix event. Yeah, so I was, just wanted to say a few words about the topic tonight. Um, the climate crisis has, been, uh, has become an intrinsic part of our lives and uh, an urgent global challenge. And largely the narratives around the climate crisis have been led by technical and scientific approaches. Uh, however, it's really clear that the role played by culture and arts has increasingly been recognized and instrumental in providing a different set of values, of narratives, of behaviors and aspiration that can really help adapt and respond to climate change. In this regard, I also wanted to share with you that ministers of culture of the European Union just very recently, last month, uh, got together and signed a declaration in which they committed to defend culture as an essential public good and a global public good at the highest political level, and also to work to make culture the 18th sustainable development goal, which would be really something wonderful to see. Uh, going into photography, uh, which is what we are going to also uh, focus on today, and storytelling, and visual storytelling, uh, these are two forms, art forms, that have really shown to be catalysts in raising awareness on the climate crisis. And in the context of Southeast Asia, which is our focus today, uh, they've really been important in really showcasing uh, a region that is very vulnerable to the far-reaching impacts of climate change. And in this sense, photography really has conveyed um, a lot and is doing a great job in raising uh, awareness in that sense. So the photographers that are with us today um, will talk about this. And the photos that you see behind you are from all the group of photographers that have taken part in the residency developed by Noor. There were 12, if I'm not wrong, 12 photographers. Uh, so while we are talking, you will be able to also see uh, some of their works. And then the works from Jitrapong, Ponit, and Lin will, will be showing when we go into the questions uh, with them. So uh, let me uh, now uh, go straight into the conversation and start with Stefano. Uh, if we can bring Stefano on the screen. Hello again. Uh, hi, Stefano. So maybe we'll start with you because we want to understand also a little bit more about the work uh, that Noor Foundation does, but also the great work that you have developed with this photojournalist um, and with the Embassy of the Netherlands in the last six months. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, well, uh, First of all, thank you very much, and um, nice to meet you all. Thank you for coming. Um, I don't see you at the moment because uh, the screen is split, but uh, I trust you there. And um, yeah, so it's uh, really it's really nice to be talking about this program, which uh, is part of a larger, um, well, more ambitious plan of the Noor Foundation. But a little bit about Noor is that. Uh, it, it, Noor was born as an agency out of the need of a group of photographers to regain uh, control over their their photographs and also their income. And they founded this agency 17 years ago. Uh, it was a very different media landscape. Um, media outlets were still assigning a lot and uh, uh, budgets were higher, or at least more well spent. Um, anyway, the landscape has changed, so Noor has always been very interested in education. We always uh, thought that education is uh, the, the key for a future. And um, visual education is, uh, is what we have been doing for 15 years. So it was a natural uh, decision to move uh, more into uh, a foundation type of uh, organization and uh, become entirely independent so that we could focus uh, all our energies in what we believe is one of the most important things that uh, visual storytellers uh, could do, which to share knowledge and to share awareness. So we bring um, this expertise, this experience and, and this uh, knowledge to the table and we have to also look at uh, what are the issues that are more pressing for us today. And climate crisis is uh, probably the greatest challenge that uh, humanity has ever faced, or at least one of the greatest, and every other theme, every other issue of today's world is somehow linked to uh, the change in climate and how we adapt to it and how we can inform others about it. 
Now there is a discrepancy and a difficulties in communicated, uh, communicating scientific research uh, to um, normal people, and uh, photography plays a, can play a, a very important role. So with this in mind, we, uh, with Kadir van der Heisen, who is a Dutch photographer, co-founder of the agency, um, we developed uh, the idea, who has worked for decades on climate crisis and research-based uh, visual stories. So he developed a whole way of doing so and um, decided that uh, perhaps it would make sense to, to, to share this knowledge with the younger photographers from different parts of the region because this is another very important point for us. 2023 is no longer the time where we should uh, feel comfortable at looking at the world always and solely through our own perspective, uh, Western based. And so perhaps it is uh, really finally the time to, uh, to share and to learn from other, uh, from people from other parts of the world, how they see uh, similar issues to the ones that we face uh, uh, or the other people face. So the plurality of perspectives can uh, allow a better understanding of what's going on. So the Southeast Asia program, which was a six months mentorship program by Kadir and Lin uh, and, and, uh, and myself uh, with 12 photographers selected through an open call from Cambodia, Thailand, Laos and Vietnam, uh, was uh, dedicated to this, to creating, to supporting the, the, the careers and, of these 12 uh, very, very talented uh, visual storytellers but also to build a body of work that would, uh, you know, 12 stories start to be quite interesting body of work on the climate crisis in the region. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty much what I can say. Thanks. We'll come back to you. Maybe we'll go to Jitrapon, since you were part of this uh, program. You're based in Chiang Mai. Uh, you have been part of the residency, and we are now going to see some of the works that you have worked on uh, during the residency. I wanted to ask you, can you share specific examples from your work where a, photogra where a photograph had a particularly powerful impact on raising awareness on climate change and specifically to the region that we are in? Yes, sure. Um, which yeah, so your um, images are showing. So um, this one is uh, the corn burning. So I um, photographed this one in my hometown, which is um, in the north of Thailand. So um, I want to bring understanding that like, um, the forest has, how much forest has been used in the northern Thailand in the, in the recent decades. A lot of lands in the, in the mountain areas has been like turned into like um, cultivation area f um, for corn. So why we have to, why they have to grow corn? Because we um, consume, um, we, we eat food and uh, the company is expanding their business. Uh, so I want to say everyone is engaging with, um, with the environment, like um, from this community, it can affect to this community. So this image, I want to show that, um, like how much corn has been grown and how much environment environment has been destroyed each year. I mean, by the burning. So, yeah, this this also contribute to climate change. So, as you know, like Chiang Mai is you know. Um, got hit by the worst air pollution in the world in yeah. March, during March. Thank you. <laughs> we'll yeah. come back to you with okay, another sure, yeah. question. Shall we move to Ponita? Ponita, you were also part of this uh, residency, but I understand that you don't consider yourself really as a photojournalist, but more as an artist. So I also wanted to understand how you approach uh, this project, and maybe if you could discuss the ethical considerations surrounding photographing vulnerable communities affected by climate change, and how do you ensure their voices are heard and respected when you approach them? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, so for the first part, you know, whether or not I'm a photojournalist or a visual artist, it's I wouldn't say I want like I belong to any particular category, but in terms of the way I approach the work, um, 
I have this understanding that as a photographer going into a world or, you know, a, into a community that I know nothing about, ultimately everything is an, an interpretation. So I choose what goes into the frame. I interpret their reality and so on. Uh, so I think that would be my approach. I'm not really looking for... I'm guided by facts, but I'm not looking for facts. I'm really just trying to understand it from a more, like, perhaps emotional or interpersonal um, perspective. And in terms of ethical considerations, I think uh, transparency is key. Without it, um, I wouldn't have been able to build the relationship and the trust with the community, and in my case, the women that I photograph. So I feel like I was only able to uh, collaborate with them or have their participation and collaboration because they knew what I was doing, they knew my intention, the intention behind my work, um, and they understood the importance of it and what I wanted to know from them. Uh, and without it, I, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, uh, move forward with the project. And um, in terms of ensuring their voices are heard and respected, uh, I don't speak for the community, so I cannot ensure that they're heard. I think I can only make sure that I hear their voices and I respect them in my process, uh, which means, you know, I, my process is guided a lot by, you know, the research that I've read and also by the conversations that I have with uh, these women. Um, and based on that, I, it, it leads or it informs my interpretation of that reality. But the rest, once the photos, once the images are out there, it's no longer my, it's no longer up to me. It's up to how the audience perceives it and, yeah. Um. Maybe you can share a bit more about the work that you've done for the, in the residency, what topic you chose and, sure. yes, just to yeah, share a uh, bit more. Sure, um, I think initially what I wanted to focus on, I wanted to look at um, the impact of climate change on sort of women really, because this was something that, that I didn't even think about beforehand, but upon, you know, reading a little bit more about climate change, I realized that, oh, it's not gender neutral. Um, in countries like Cambodia, women are disproportionately at risk. So ultimately going in, I wasn't, my intention wasn't to show vulnerability, so to speak. My mm -hmm. intention wasn't to corroborate the findings. I think it was just for me personally, it was to explore um, what it means to be a woman in these circumstances. So I was able to bond with them on like a woman to woman level as well. So we talked about things like beauty, which, you know, is quite interesting for me as well as, you know, motherhood and not that I'm a mother, but uh, motherhood and, you know, sacrifices and their concerns for the future. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, uh, maybe we, we ask you a question now. So you were a facilitator in this program. Um, maybe you can share a little bit more on the common challenges and breakthroughs that photographers encounter when documenting climate change in the context of Southeast Asia. And how do you help them to overcome these challenges? So in the context of this residency, uh, how did you manage to help them to sort of go through with their work? Uh, thank you very much for the questions. And uh, actually, the, the photo sourcing here is, is, is not part of the program. It's just my personal project where I've been working on. So my name is Ling Pham. I'm from uh, Hanoi, Vietnam. And I've been, uh, I'm a photographer. And uh, I've been uh, covering and, 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 and working in this region of Southeast Asia for the last over a decade. And actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in in, in in climate related stories or whatever, but then but then just to the point I just realized that a big portion of my my work have been done uh, you know like like a, a part of them are kind of like consequences of the of, of this this climate crisis we are on facing it could be the immigration to the city you know due to the loss of land or you know the spread of new malaria variety due to the the, the warmer temperature. And then, and then, and that's the day. Realized that actually a big portion of my work has something to do with 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 the current situation we are living in, and 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 and, and with the climate topic. So and 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 the thing I just witnessed is that we, the 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 the, the photographer or like the, the visual reporter, we are on the ground, we are out there in the field, and then we just 
we just in a very, very unique position that we, we have to study on those research, on those reports from, from the science war, as well as gathering a lot of information on the ground, you know, and, and it, it could be, you know, like, like Fox kind of like story, Fox knowledge, or, you know, many times it's like some feeling, sensory, you know, and then and, and your observation to the place and how to put uh, those two words together and then trying to fill that gap and to deliver a product that is understandable, that is approachable to the, to the bigger audience. And, 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 and I think that's the challenge we are having in, 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 in the photography world or, or like in reporting in climate related story as well. And then that's the challenge I was facing along with the people at the North Foundation, Kadian and Stefano. We were trying to figure out how, 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 to, how to make it work, how to, to provide a solution to the group of the people here, very t 12 young, very talented photographers coming out of this region. And then, and, and, and like to me myself, it was, it was a learning process as well. And then I, I got to go to a conclusion to this group that we have to face this. The climate has already been changing since the, since the beginning of, of time, you know. It's not that's just something just happened that last week, you know, that we have to learn and we have to adapt it. So that's the thing that we constantly, in a kind of like adaptive position, trying to understand it and, 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 and trying to work with it and, and trying to find some empathy and, and trying to, to improve the situation we are on. And, and I think that's the, that's the kind of like point of view I got from, from you know, like, like guiding the group here. And, 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 and I think that's the, that's the vision that, that we're having together, we, we're sharing together. Mm. Yep. Thank you. I want to move to David because we, we want to understand also uh, sort of going out of the more artistic side of things into real the the reporting um, part. So David, you have extensive experience in reporting on uh, climate, um, and I wanted to ask you as an environmental uh, environmental journalist uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, what role do you think photography and visual storytelling? Uh, play uh, in your way of reporting uh, your stories, and how do you collaborate with photographers and and sort of uh, get your content enhanced by the use of images? And I see that you already have a very nice one here. Maybe we can start with this. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that um, <clears throat> get to that illustration in a minute. Um, just as a broad overview, I mean, I mean, yes, I spend a lot of my time writing using words. But pictures, of course, and visuals are the really the, the tools that really can bring a story to life, um, and you know it helps us sort of visualise the people or person that we're talking about, uh, the work they do, the research that they're conducting, uh, the perils they face. Um, you, you can only sort of describe that to some degree in words. You really need the visuals to really make that connection, and particularly the particularly the human connection. Um, and so that means pictures really are an integral part of news planning. So what, um, what we do at the Straits Times and, and even at Reuters, where I was beforehand, uh, we're always taught to think of pictures when planning and writing a story. So that means really from right from the start, you work with your pictures colleagues. Um, and that can have a double benefit, right? Because it, it helps give them the context of the story from the start. And, and photojournalists also do, do a lot of their own research, uh, visual sort of research, with images and so forth. And that can bring up additional sort of ideas or benefits, um, um, you know, themes that you hadn't thought of. So it's, it's that extra collaboration that can actually make a, a much better story. Um, and I can give two examples. Um, in 2018, the Straits Times did a seven part series called The Climate of Change. Um, and there was 20, 20 people involved in this. So reporters, photographers, uh, videographers, graphic artists. Um, and we went um, right around the region. So uh, there was a story from um, Myanmar, from uh, Vietnam, Australia, India, uh, South Africa. Uh, I'm trying to remember the other one. Um, but essentially, it was looking at different aspects of the impacts of climate change on people, but then also solutions, so we didn't want just an entirely doom and gloom narrative. Um, and photographers and videographers went with reporters on, on each of those trips. So for me, I went 
with a colleague, um, uh, Mark Chong, who's a, a senior photographer at the Straits Times, and we went to um, sounds like it, it sounds like a hard luck um, trip that we went to the Great Barrier Reef um, in Queensland. Uh, so we did 11 days basically from Port Douglas down to Townsville, then back to Cairns, um, visiting the reef. So going out with experts to look at the reef and photograph photograph the reef, places where the reef had not been badly bleached and places where it had been, talking to, to coral scientists, uh, talking to other scientists that are trying to breed more heat resistant corals, uh, conservationists as well as tourism operators, just to really give a, a flavor. Um, so traveling with a photographer and planning that really made a difference. Uh, and you know, the, the, I think the visuals from that, uh, both the, the, the videos and the, the photographs were were extremely good. Mm. And that was the same for all the other uh, elements of that whole series. So, um, second more recent example was um, uh, uh, last month I worked with two colleagues in, in Indonesia to uh, write about an in-depth story about Indonesia's dependency on coal. Um, so the photographs of that were basically taken from a huge coal-fired power plant complex to the west of Jakarta where you can just see the pollution being spewed out, affecting the local people, and the smoke then drifts across and affects Jakarta. So that was, getting those pictures was quite crucial, and it was a little bit risky, because uh, the security guards in that area uh, don't like reporters and, and actively uh, you know, uh, dissuade them from, from taking pictures. Um, but the other thing too, as you mentioned, you know, visuals um, include videos and graphics. So what we also try to do is, so this was a story that I did in um, July this year, because there was so much crazy weather going on around the world with heat records being broken. Um, so in addition just to, to graphics and showing uh, you know, ocean or, or sea surface temperatures and, and uh, global air temperatures and so forth, uh, our graphics department came up with this wonderful sort of graphic to really to sort of capture, it, 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 sort of the, the sense of sort of the chaos, I guess. Um, and then there was another example, I don't know whether you've got it, but it's a more recent. Okay, so this is a more recent story, uh, this is back in September, um, about China's power paradox, where China was building all these coal-fired power stations, but also building huge amounts of renewables. So the whole story is surrounded by this illustration. Um, I'm not sure, you have to go down to see the dragon. So one part of the dragon is coal, and the other part is renewable energy. Um, so it's, we, we just happen to have a very clever yeah. graphics team, yeah. and, and it really makes a difference to a story. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it, so. it, yeah, it looks great. So, yep. Thanks, David. Matthias, can we also talk to you? I mean, I'm very happy, actually, to have you as well, because uh, a real scientist who really works on climate change with a focus on cities. You've been based here for a long time, so your research, I'm sure, is very significant. And when we talked before this call, I remember that I was explaining to you that we come from a cultural perspective, and sometimes we feel that maybe there's not enough exchanges between scientists and artists in trying to bring out um, better uh, the concerns about climate change. So I wanted to ask you, first of all, if you can share a bit more on the key trends uh, in Southeast Asia re regarding climate change, since you work on this directly. And also, how can visuals help convey especially very complex issues that I'm sure you, you are familiar with that, that maybe, maybe are not so easy for a broader audience to understand. Um, thank you, Valentina, and thanks for having me here. This works, I guess? Okay, yes, yes. great. You uh, just keep yes. it a little near. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, maybe you have to remind me of the second part of the question if I don't answer yeah, it. Yeah, sure, please. But the first part of the question, um, I, I guess it's probably useful to highlight again uh, that there's a clear influence of humans on, on climate change, which results in the warming of the atmosphere, the land, and the oceans. So the entire ocean atmospheric system is warmed up by 
human-induced climate change, anthropogenic climate change, and which is on top of natural climate change. So this is an equivocal, so there's no debate about this. That's what the, the science says. Um, I think it's probably useful to just stress this uh, again. Um, so in terms of three areas of concern, or the, the main concerns here are uh, changes in air temperature, changes in uh, sea level rise, or in sea level, and changes in rainfall. <coughs> So in terms of rainfall, uh, some areas will have more rainfall uh, due to climate change, others will have less rainfall, even within the Southeast Asia region. In terms of air temperature and sea level, they just go up and up and up. So that's quite clear as well. So in terms of uh, concerns uh, more locally, um, people in cities will be affected a lot, um, especially in uh, an urban context as Southeast Asia is. And it's not just because of global warming, of anthropogenic global warming, it's also because of local climate change. And here I'm referring to the urban heat island effect, which a lot of people don't talk about, but it's, uh, it's on the same order of magnitude as is the, the climate change as we in, uh, or the global warming as we're experiencing it right now. So we're talking about sort of a, a global temperature increase within, well, since, since the late uh, 19th century of about 1.1 or 1.2 degrees C going forward, depending on which scenario we're looking at, another one, two, three degrees will be added to. So cities themselves on average throughout the year can add up to one degree of warming. So that locally produced climate change is of the same order of magnitude as what we talk about in terms of the global background and well, global anthropogenic warming. Um, so this will increase um, this will increase heat stress of people. This will deteriorate um, uh, thermal comfort of people. And especially, uh, this is of course the case in areas where we already have high background temperatures, such as here in the tropics. This may be uh, of a lesser issue somewhere else in, in Canada. Maybe you you actually like this kind of uh, additional heat or temperature, but not necessarily here. You want to try to avoid this. Um, also, for the region here, we need, uh, in terms of uh, uh, kind of challenges in understanding what climate change does to us here, we need a better understanding of impacts on the agricultural systems. Uh, this region here, well, first of all, we have to produce uh, food for the local population. This may be... Uh, well, difficult or there may need to be changes in terms of food production systems, depending on how the monsoonal systems change, how rainfall will, will change and develop. Uh, but also the region here is a very uh, important uh, exporter of a lot of agricultural products, corn and rice, for, for example. So it affects, the effects uh, go beyond just the region here. And in terms of the, the third uh, major concern, I'd say is, um, how, do, how does the melting of the Himalayan glaciers affect the water flows in the, in the main rivers here? If you, if you look at the map, the geography, uh, all the big rivers in Southeast Asia, and not just in Southeast Asia, in South Asia as well, in East Asia as well, have their origins in the Tibetan Plateau in the Himalayan regions. And we do know these glaciers are rapidly melting, which will affect the river flow and with a lot of downstream uh, effects and a lot of interesting or maybe not so interesting or scary geopolitical uh, implications as well. So, so basically, yeah, in, in line with what mm. you just shared, I was wondering if you have experience or you, you, you're working closely with photographers to try to bring these issues a little bit more um, in touch with, with, you know, with, with audiences out there. I mean, we know that climate crisis among us, but sometimes people living in more privileged environment, I'm just thinking about us in Singapore, we maybe don't experience so much of the bigger phenomenon that are around us. Is there, have you worked before or do you see um, a way for this information to be uh, spread in a more easy way through uh, photography, visual storytelling and other art forms such as these? Well, I have to admit, in terms of collaboration with, um, with artists or photographers directly, very little I've done, I guess. So it's a uh, good start to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is it for me here, yes, right. So I'm um, making a lot of good connections, I hope. And uh, 
things will improve. But uh, in terms of collaborations with uh, journalists, yes, because I think it's really important to get the message out, and uh, especially for scientists who mostly sit in their offices, I guess, and work uh, on computers and don't get out and produce wonderful results. Yes, that's great for a scientific audience. So I think that's where the, uh, the photographers come in and the journalists, um, which then can maybe convey a very complex scientific issue um, uh, in, in a much more um, convenient way for the majority of the population to, to grasp. And also, unlike a scientific paper, a photograph or a story, an infographic, um, evokes an emotional response. A scientific uh, paper doesn't, I think. Yes, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> but having said this, I can get excited about the scientific uh, finding of paper, but uh, probably the majority of the population doesn't. But the majority yeah. of the population of people, they need, they need to be informed, right? And they get the information probably from newspapers and through photographs and videographics mm -hmm. or YouTube videos. So I think as scientists, we I think we have to do a better job to get the message out through those means. Thank you, Matthias. I want to go back to Stefano, if we can bring him back to us. Hello, back. Uh, here we are. <laughs> Hi, Stefano. Yeah, so, Stefano, you, you followed the conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more um, maybe on how uh, it, projects like the one that you run, and I understand the educational side of them, but how are you able also to bring the results of this project to uh, the policy level, to kind of be able to influence somehow a decision taken by policymakers, by international organizations that are working in this case on the area of climate change. So how organization like NOR can kind of create a connection between uh, on the ground projects like the one that you run, the residency that you organize, and then uh, more of the, of the policy side um, in this sense, if you can share with us. Well, I would if I knew. Yeah, that's a big <laughs> question. I know it's not easy. Huh? It's, no, it's not, but also, and I did follow the conversation, so thank you for all the guests. It was inspiring and interesting. Um, it is difficult to measure impact. I mean, this word that uh, fund, you know, that, that foundations to which you ask for money would like to really see cl crystal clear in your paragraph about how do you measure the impact. It's, it's really difficult because, as Matthias said, uh, the impact that we try to generate, uh, I guess, uh, at least that's what I think, with images, with visual storytelling, is, is emotional and it's a connection. Uh, so we do this job to bridge, to get closer to the other, not to separate. So how do you measure that? It's really complicated. How you inspire a, um, a person of power to push for a change that I don't, I do not know, but I do think that it goes through the heart um, and sometimes their wallets. So, since we can't really measure how to reach uh, the second part of the equation, so how to convince policymakers to reflect and change now, because that's what we actually would need an immediate revolution of our the, almost the entirety of our. Um, lives. So I think that what we what we know we can do is to make sure that we use the work we produce to do something else, meaning to talk about it, to bring people together in an event such as this one, um, wherein maybe new connections can be made. And next time Matthias has an idea that can share with a photographer, and the photographer can enhance the results of his. Uh, research for a wider audience. So that is the impact that we would like to, to generate. So it's more, I am far more, in, as a creative director of the foundation, I'm far more interested in the grassroots movement than um, the policy making process. First of all, I understand the first better. Uh, it's more my bread. Secondly, I think that we can't really wait for policies to change uh, from top. So we need to inform as many people as many people as possible, we need to move them in, 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 you know, we need to play a role into moving people into action. 
And visual storytelling is as old as humans. I mean, we start painting uh, caves uh, some, somewhere between 70,000 to 30,000 years ago. And uh, that was the beginning of visual storytelling, perhaps. So it's, it's a very old uh, tradition humans uh, have to pass on knowledge and uh, of, of different types. So we do believe in that, and I think that what we're trying to really do, and it is, you know, this is the third program on climate crisis that we run. We're running another two uh, in, in Western Africa. Hopefully there'll be more next year from different parts of the world. So one of the biggest questions is that once that we've produced all this amazing work, because it is truly fascinating how good the work comes out after six months working together, uh, what do we do with it? Yeah. Um, so at the moment, uh, and then I'm, I'm close, sorry if I went a bit longer, but at the moment what we're really trying to do is, uh, you know, this work is produced locally, it should be shared locally, um, regionally, across borders. It was impossible to exhibit it publicly in Vietnam for... Yeah, um, this is also good for you reasons. to share, actually, because these challenges are, uh, sometimes we forget about it, but it's also a way to kind of try go beyond that, right? So maybe you can share a bit more about that as well. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we always, part of our program at the end, well, you know, we're developing these programs while we do them. So the next one will be different. And again, and the next one different from the next, you know, like each will be different and probably hopefully better. But we do have one very clear thing is there must be a closing event, a closing moment. It is good for the participants. Uh, it is good for us. It is good for the people who can benefit from, uh, from the content that we produce. So we usually have an exhibition. Um, hopefully, you know, it travels to, to the countries that the people are from. Uh, in Vietnam, we knew since the beginning it would have been hard because the other idea we strongly have is that we would like to bring the exhibition so the work to the people and not vice versa, which means that uh, exhibitions should be in open spaces and easily accessible. And Vietnam has a very strong censorship, uh, uh, especially on climate uh, crisis related uh, uh, initiatives. And so when you have, when you face that, firstly, you know that you're onto something good, because otherwise, why would they stop it? But you have to face the fact that uh, it is not easy to to use it after, because it's also dangerous. People get arrested and harassed, and that's the we did. We wouldn't want that. So we are now in the process of understanding how we can still use this work in the coming months and years to continue to talk about things that are happening. And Matthias, uh, I think he mentioned three main uh, areas of concern in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, you know, I think there are these three main. Uh, areas of concern are represented in the plot stories that we produce, you know, uh, differences in uh, rainfalls is uh, one of the main subjects in several stories, uh, and uh, so on, uh, the rest. So we have material that can facilitate this conversation, and we are trying to find ways to bring it around uh, across borders in the region. At the same time, we are bringing this work to Europe. Um, and, and, and mingling and mixing it with the work from Central Europe or from Eastern Africa or from Western Africa, because in the end, they are very similar. In the end, the issues that people have found and uh, the human stories that in the end is the face of the climate crisis, they're very, very similar. So when you are in Hungary and you see that your counterpart in Hanoi or, or in Abidjan has found a very similar um, is worried about a similar thing. This brings us closer. It makes it more shared. It makes uh, a community tighter. So that's our goal. That's how we. That's what we're trying to do. We do hope that this also reaches uh, a higher level of decision-making processes, and that perhaps uh, people are moved into uh, more careful reflection when approving. Um, certain policies other than others. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, I, I completely relate with what you're saying because uh, the projects we organize in ASEF are also very much uh, doing that. So trying to bring together government level, civil society. But it's true that there are so many initiatives at the grassroots level that are happening. And I'm just 
thinking about Southeast Asia because in the context of Southeast Asia, not only around climate change, so many new initiatives that are not really waiting for government support are developing. And this is something I think very significant that organization like ours can help to kind of bring uh, forward and maybe more make more visible also to governments when they take decision and they do policies. Um, I want to ask Lina, And Valentina, yes, if, I, yes, please. if I may add to close, sure. it's, it's, you know, like I have, um, I, I mean, this is 15 years that I work with visual storytelling and and I, I, you know, one thing that is very clear for me is that uh, you never know if there was this one person in the audience that you really touched and uh, this person will go on and become a lawyer that defends human rights because also partly of what, uh, of the inspiration that uh, he had in that one evening when you talked with passion about your work. So you never know this and uh, it is very clear always for me, it's, it's, not, it's not important to reach as many people as possible. Uh, it's important to reach them with, with true passion and with true empathy, but it is also important to reach the right people. So, you know, you have to do a little bit of both. You never know if in the audience there will be the person that can actually bring a solution forward. So, um, I think that that uh, deserves our care whenever we expose our work, whenever we present our work to, to the world, knowing that it, has, it will affect some. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Stefano. Uh, maybe, Lynn, just to continue a little bit uh, on, this, uh, on this kind of role that you had as facilitator, but also in your own practice as a photographer, um, how do you kind of uh, navigate the two? Is there, uh, you know, do you find that, I suppose, you find it enriching to be able to also share your practice, uh, your knowledge with other younger photographers and kind of help them to, to grow um, in their practice. Do you want to share a bit more about that? Right, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, 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 I do believe that photography has the power to impress, you know, and, and, and to convey. But, but then narrative has you to understand. And that's when we just becoming in, in the middle point of visual storyteller, we just combine those two to produce the product that is, is visually is, is approachable and at, at the same time is understandable to the, to the outside world. And actually by, by, by working as a photojournalist, I, I, I just realized that I, 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 I do a lot of my research as well. I, I read the paper and then and the scientific paper and so on. I just realized that photography, photographer alone, you know, we always constantly trying to get that single images that can represent the story, which is, you know, like many times it's, it's not working, you know. But then, but then, uh, uh, at the same time, you know, like, like uh, it's going to take you a, a few scientific papers just to get to the problem. And then that, that was happening with the group we have as well because we have a few you know, like uh, trained scientists working in this program together with us, you know, and then right now they, they, they're trying to develop their practice as photographer, and they actually, they're the, the people who are like confused the most, because it's just not very easy to map those two worlds together, but that's the question we're constantly seeking out, and then we're constantly trying to make understand of, you know, and, and, and it does just keep us in a very, very unique kind of like position, and, and so I think that, that the only way to make it work is just to, to, to continue kind of like trying and then trying to keep out there, trying to get the, work, the, the job done first, you know. Like the last six months, we already got something and give it out to the world, trying to get some feedback, you know, to see what's that. You know, g give that to the general audience, give that to experts like, like Matthias here, you know, and, and, and David, and start getting feedback and start having reflection and trying to improve it. I think it's a, a constantly improving kind of like, like situation, you know, so I, I, I don't have an answer for it yet, but I think it's, it's, it's a progress and it's yeah, a long progress, it's, it's a, a yeah, ongoing it's a, progress. Yes. Yes. But I think the more uh, you kind of share what you're doing and get maybe younger people photographer to be part of it, I think that's also quite enriching, right, in the process of facilitating as well. Uh, Jitra Pong, I wanted to go back to you and ask you um, if maybe your, your understanding, your perception, your feeling also about the climate crisis, if it has changed through the experience of this residency, 
or even through the process of photography. If you can maybe share a little bit more about that. In, in what ways has your perspective on climate change evolved through your work? Um, well, um, from my experience, after I, I did like, um, a story on air pollution in Northern Thailand since 2014, so um, when the corn, the, the burning of cornfield, um, it makes me um, understand more like how we engage with, you know, uh, climate change, and then you know like, and then Thailand has been experienced the worst drought in history in 2016 or 17, something like that. Um, I mean, the extreme weather is, is showing, like, and it's close to us. And, you know, like, in the recent years, I mean, it's keep breaking the records. Before, it was, like, worst drought in history. But now it's even worse than that, you know, like. So, um, yeah, so why not, like, um, bring my um, visual story from that time and then, you know, like, make it as, like, um, more of present time and make it, you know, like, uh, um, make make impact from from this point. Do you have uh, after you sort of share your work in Chiang Mai itself? Do you have conversation also with the communities, with people living there? Uh, do you see that the work that you're doing through photography has helped as well locally in in understanding more about climate change? Um, um, yes, it's. It's important to bring understanding and bring awareness because we are living in the different um, community. We don't see like I see if I don't go, like people won't see. Like so, photography is like an evidence that okay, it happens like this. Photograph um, does not lie, and I spent time to find you know like a nice photograph to tell the stories. Um, so um, we need to. Um, bring awareness and then um, move forward together and you know like um, change in the policy levels like for example in these issues like um, we need to kind of like take responsibility especially like big company that has a lot of benefits from it mm. yeah. thanks Punita I'm gonna ask you um, maybe a similar question to Chitrapong, uh, in a way, if the work that you've done through this residency has somehow changed your understanding and your perception of uh, climate crisis, and then maybe also uh, what unique challenges and opportunities you think photographers face when they document climate change. So in your specific case, when you went out and you kind of approached uh, the women, farmers, uh, what, how, how was that? Tell us a bit more about it. Um, sure, so the first question well, the about... The first question is kind of looking at the experience of the okay. residency yeah. that has changed uh, your understanding, your perception of the climate crisis. Oh, absolutely. I'm, um, I don't really have a method in doing things in general, so what this residency actually helped me do was to actually think of how to approach the topic methodically using research to guide the process and and it was because of that that you know that brought to light the issue of the gender inequality with regards to the climate crisis so had i not done that had i not done extensive enough research i probably would not have um found the story in a way so i think uh yeah it, it brought something to light for me and i think um, it made me want to connect a little bit better as well with you know communities affected or women that were affected. Um, in terms of challenges, of course, you know, um, as been mentioned earlier as well, climate change can be a sensitive topic. It, but in the case of Cambodia, climate change alone is not necessarily um, sensitive, but dis but it could lead to discussions around topics about the environment that can be seen as political or that can be politicized, and so people, individuals may be resistant to sharing, you know, their genuine concerns and um, have their lives documented. Um, so the political climate in Cambodia does have an impact on working there. And when I was working there, that was this was during the elections. 
So yeah, there was some curiosity around why I was walking around asking questions <laughs> with a camera. But I think, um, <laughs> so I think that I just needed to make sure that the story I was telling and you know the people I, whose story I'm telling is, I'm trying to tell or interpret is uh, purely to do with climate change. That's to, it's to do with farming and livelihood and the effect of heat and unpredictable rainfall, or the sky, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, that the community is obviously, they trust that what I'm doing is not going to endanger them because it's their identity is being exposed, right? So yeah, that was one, that, that's a challenge. Um, another one I would say, and it's a bit of an opportunity as well, um, it's the fact that knowledge of climate change and or the science behind it and what causes it is lacking, especially in rural areas where, you know, educate, well, there, where people tend to be less educated and so on. So a lot of the times when I ask questions to do with climate change, they're unable to answer because they're not really sure what causes crop failure necessarily. They just say, oh, the rain's not feeding us this time. And, you know, we don't know why it's so strange. So, you know, to have something um, factual is, is difficult. But at the same time, this presents itself the opportunity for me to see okay, where the problem is, to bring to light the issue of knowledge and education, right? And perhaps if I can continue the work um, and further the research and find more examples and continue photographing, I could possibly appeal to um, entities or organizations that can help spread that kind of knowledge. So in that sense, it's, it's an opportunity. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, actually. Yeah, the both sides are valid, right? Thank you. Thank you, Punita. David, um, I'm going to ask you uh, uh, another question, just going back to uh, the relationship with journalists, photographers, and maybe how do you think they can collaborate effectively to ensure that there is an impact? I mean, what Stefano was saying, right? Trying not only to tell a story and visually support it that can be uh, impactful to the people who are reading it now, but in the long term, is that possible by collaborating uh, better? And also going back to policy changes in the region, so the whole idea of what is written and what is visually uh, more impactful can be also uh, received better by the people who are making the policies. So if you can maybe share a bit more on that from your experience. Yeah, well, again, from my experience, getting involved with the, with the photographers or the picture department from the start is key. So, um, because you, you know, when you put a lot of effort into one of these projects, you want to have maximum impact. Obviously, you want to affect change. That's why you, particularly if it's an investigative story or it's, you know, it's a story that where climate impacts are so apparent and have direct impacts on the environment and on people. So you really want to sort of bring that out uh, and hope that it can, it can drive a change, be it in people's behavior or policies. Um, so that's, that to me is the most effective way. You, you need to have an idea of where your story is going and, and what impact you want to have. Uh, sometimes you can't always foresee that. Sometimes you've got to go on that journey first and then figure out afterwards is exactly how it looks. Um, but I, so I asked this question of, of my colleague Mark Chong early today, and one of the things he pointed out is that more than ever, um, the, that collaboration, that two-way collaboration between the photographer and journalist, or the reporter, is, is vital, particularly in the age of social media, because it's the, it's the pictures that are people, are, are, that's the hook. With so, so much information out there, the, the, the thing that will get people, well, can be a headline, but more often than not, it's the image that will get them first to click on that. And be, be it, and also it's not just pictures; it can be a you know a graphic. It could be a video, a TikTok video. So you've the other thing too with the collaboration, you have to figure out what medium as well is going to be most effective because the, the mediums that we use are evolving all the time. It's no longer just pictures, obviously. It's it's so many others, and there'll be other mediums that will come along. So you've also then got to keep up to date with, <laughs> with the evolving sort of visual landscape as well. Do you use more, uh, do you rely more on communication on social media as, in a, as a trend 
when we talk about climate change, for example, and the reporting that you do, for example, the series you were mentioning before, that's obviously like a sort of documenting, so in a, in a longer format. But is that something that you also present maybe on a smaller bite size uh, for social media? Because that's where you feel that there is more impact. Is that something that you would do? Uh, it, it can do. So increasingly for longer form stories that we do, um, our interactive graphics people create a different version. Um, so it's more of a version that you can scroll down on yeah. your mobile phone. Sort of the version that you see on the New York Times, where it's, it's sort of summarized, so the key points are summarized, and it's quite visual so as you scroll through. I mean, that's, that's absolutely key. No one's going to scroll through 2,500 words on their phone, right? So, um, but also, just in terms of reach, um, increasingly Telegram, mm. uh, LinkedIn. Mm. Um, I've come back to using LinkedIn because that's an effective way and a good visual um, can really, uh, you know, good visual storing, telling, telling narrative uh, can be really helpful. In fact, there was one I came across yesterday from ABC Australia on five climate and conservation scientists who have been, um, you know, their work has been, um, I wouldn't say suppressed, but but they've not been allowed to speak as freely about their work in the media, and this is just in Australia, mm -hmm. for a variety of political sort of reasons. Um, but now some of them are retired, and now they're finally coming out to speak. And so it was, it was a nice narrative of all five scientists with pictures of them mm -hmm. about their story. Yeah. And that was, I thought that was a really effective way to, to do that. So, so. Yeah, that's yeah, good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, David. Matthias, I'm gonna I'm gonna end with the with a question for you, and then we're gonna open uh, for question from our public. Um, I mean, we do understand that, as you mentioned before, um, maybe you haven't really relied too much on working with photographers, but in a more scientific way, I suppose you do rely on photography to sort of document things. So I wanted to ask you if there are instances where you have seen photography influence the public perception of climate change and sort of drive positive environmental actions in the region or even here in Singapore, if you have experience in that sense. Um, OK. Um. I'm answering this uh, not from a scientific point of view in terms of uh, images uh, which I can think of which uh, possibly have uh, driven action or evoked action. Um, so one of them is related to glaciers. Uh, glaciers are a um, good indicator of the planet's temperature. So one picture I'm thinking of is a glacier or glaciers covered with uh, sheets of white fabric to stop them from melting away, which I think um, um, passes on a very powerful message in, in many ways. Maybe not so applicable to here, but I'm from Switzerland, so <laughs> I'm emotionally attached to glaciers and I hate them uh, seeing melting away, but this is what they, they do. And also, if you see them uh, covered, or parts of them covered with with uh, these uh, white sheets, uh, it also shows the futility or the desperation of uh, human beings or mankind to try to do something about climate change. It is a band-aid solution and we'll not be able to, to preserve glaciers and ice sheets as we would like to. So the other image, uh, which has probably, um, it's probably more applicable also to here is that of smoke caves. Uh, people working in the fields with masks uh, surrounded by burning uh, forests or images from an airplane uh, flying over an area that is affected by, by smoke haze uh, where we can see the huge spatial extent of this haze which is not just here locally but it covers uh, vast areas of, of land and Chitraporn had one of these images showing about burning uh, cornfields in, in, in Malaysia, uh, in, in northern Thailand. So I, I think these kind of images uh, can be used as powerful agents of change, possibly. Uh, I would like to, um, I'm, I'm a little 
a little bit skeptical about the influence they have on driving policies, I'd say. Yes, they're great educational tools, um, but I think um, to drive action, I think somebody has to be exposed to that hazard, to feel that hazard firsthand before that person or people will actually go out and try to change things. And I think we could experience this uh, quite nicely during the prolonged haze period uh, in 2014, 15, transboundary haze, primarily from Indonesia, burning uh, um, yeah, land or clearing land for palm oil um, production, uh, where calls uh, came up in, in by pu the public here in the media about, well, maybe we should uh, ban products which uh, contain palm oil. And it went so far that even the National Environment Agency here, and maybe elsewhere as well, they started to litigate companies which uh, were listed on the local stock exchange. And this was only possible, I think, because of the severe impact here, and everybody was exposed to it and was living through. An image alone, probably from a burning field somewhere else, may not have evoked this, this reaction, I think. Thank you. Let's ask our... Yes, wonderful. I like this enthusiasm. Please, Jeffrey, question. Which he, sorry, which? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, yes, there is an online gallery on Culture360, so I think it will be there. Yes, Corinne? Yes, <laughs> it will be there. We kind of showed a little bit here, but all the artists that have participated there is a showcase, so we, we will share that. We are working on a web portal right now, no, because the work is the mix of video, photography, and text, you know, so it's taking us a while, but I think it's about to publish like now, in this moment. Oh, okay, so, great. So once it's finished, I can pass over to ASAP, and sure. you can uh, share across your channels. Yeah. Emphasis. So I'm just wondering how. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question is, do the images come with some kind of a context or focus from the photographers, so that people who haven't been part of that process uh, can gain insight into each of the pictures? Yes. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you very much for the question. Actually, that's what we did early on. Because yeah, for, for us, information and, and, and context is, is, is so crucial. And that's what our first few sessions of the, this, this, this workshop or like mentoring program was all about. We sat down one week together just trying to get the text done. And, 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 and that's when they, they know where they're heading to before coming out in the field. You know, they know which section of information they need to gather, who they need to speak to. And then that's when we are working on the web portal right now with fully written story accompanying by the photograph and then some with the video and, 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 and sound as well. So, yep. But then, but then that's what uh, Punita can say a little bit because for like her work, you know, if without the context, you just couldn't get it. You know, like, like why gender, why woman with, with, with climate and in the rural Cambodia, you know? Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, I think for, for mine especially, context is important. Um, I think during my process, I recorded a lot of the conversations that I have with them, and I use those quotes to sort of supplement, you know, the images as well, because I think knowing what they've said and so on, and also, you know, I, I don't want to be misquoting or anything like that. Um, I think that's important because, like I mentioned, the images is purely my interpretation of their reality, but what that needs to be paired with is perhaps research, um, information that I've taken from research, facts, figures, as well as the words from um, the women themselves, yeah. Any other question? Yes, Lily. Okay. Um, I'm Lily, I, um, I live here in Singapore, so welcome to the artists who are here. Um, I have a, um, a photography platform for Singapore and one of the topics that I'm working on is actually on um, rising sea levels. So I, I come to these kind of talks to, uh, to borrow ideas and to see kind of what's going on. 
So I, I have a question for the artists, and maybe even for David, who uh, is running the, the media side of things, of this. Whether or not you get a feeling in your country or a part of your country where there is a specific focus of which part of the climate crisis really needs discussion. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of another project that I did, which then I started to learn how important it was to have this focus, and that was on mental health. So mental health is a, everybody talks mental health now, uh, but I decided we couldn't talk mental health everything, so I had to pick an age group, so 10 to 29. So this is now very much in the uh, public awareness and in public opinion. This is about driving public opinion, right? And, and the reason why all of this got very interested with the Ministry of Education, with the government and everybody here, parents and all that, was because we were starting to publicize suicide numbers of these very young people. And so public uh, mental health of young people then became quite, quite a big topic. And then everybody, lots of people had to rally around it, school programs and whatnot, right? Uh, as well as uh, uh, getting more professionals. But I, I have to remember the early days of kind of mental health discussion were actually around specific things. <laughs> there was one thing around autism and then the school started, the program started, and all, so it's one thing. So my question in, in that long thing is, is to get this, this, this uh, civic contract of photography. Okay, so Azule from um, Israel talked about, published that book a long time ago, and it was about the Palestinian problem. So it's called the civic contract of photography. So you want to have a contract now with the population, right? But to have a contract, you have to know what is it that you're actually talking about. So in your countries, the uh, countries that you work on and are so familiar with, do you get a sense that somebody or somebodies are starting to tell you, you know, Vietnam, I, I think this, this, is, this is our big thing. You sort of touched on that. You said, look, where I am is really about pollution and fires and you know, air quality and all that, but that's you. So is your environment and your government thinking that, yeah, that's a thing we need to deal with, right? right. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, that's, that's a uh, really interesting one. I do believe it, it is both way because, uh, you know, you, you know uh, climate-related kind of like issues are on around us, but yeah, like, like we do have our empathy on a certain things, you know, and, and much of that is t due to the propaganda or like the, the media we are receiving in. And in my case, in Vietnam, we talk a lot about the Mekong. You know, and then also the, the, the topic of the, the Mekong, because it's so relatable to all other neighboring countries as well, and with a big player as China. And that's why we just keep talking about the Mekong. But I, I do believe it's, it's why we keep talking about that is it's also at the kind of like government strategy level, you know. But then, so I, I, I can share to you because um, uh, during the, the, the program, we have two people covering the, the Mekong in the Vietnam side, very close to the ocean, and is it is consequent of the, the rising sea level. One girl, she's working on the topic of, because of the rising salinity level, you couldn't grow rice anymore, you know? And then, and then, and then you have to switch to stream farming. But to the point that the salinity level getting so high, even the stream cannot adapt with that anymore. So they're working on a new kind of like stream variety, a new species that is like more, you know, like, like adaptable, like sustainable, like stronger, that could work with the new kind of like, like uh, level of, of water over there. And another story is that, is that very, very close to the, the, this guy, he's following a group of water fighter or like a well, a well digger, you know, because, uh, because of the, the rising sea level, a lot, a, a big population in the Mekong in, in Vietnam, they don't have fresh water anymore. But then, but then at the government level, we, 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 we ban on kind of like digging, you know, because that, that just like make the land become lower and then, and, you know, the, 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 city, the situation is getting worse and worse. But people, they still need to live, you know, they still need water to survive. So there's that group of people, you know, they, they do the service, they offer the service, they're going around the dental of, of, of Vietnam, you know, like, like dig those well for, 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 for the consumer. 
and 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 that's the 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 the, the, the contrast story. You know, we we we've been we've been exploring in 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 Vietnam, but then also I I think a, a big portion of what we yeah, we will refer to place to a place, and there's certainly there's gonna be one issues pop up, you know. But I think that's a, a big portion of it is thanks to the media, you know, like what what is speaking out there, you know, or what's on the radar. So I, I think uh, David can share a little bit that, about that, maybe I know about. So, to, so just to answer, go back to your question. Your, your question was more on. Um, Topics of climate change that are being discussed and, on, and topics that, that aren't? Has picked a focus. Has picked a focus. For, for example, in Vietnam, uh, the overriding concern on the Mekong River and the Delta and livelihood, and that's a long river, and it would, that's, that's, that's going to provide a lot of. Uh, available content and photographs, and it's it, it's I guess what marketing would call like a rolling thunder. You know, you can keep thundering, you know, through different projects, different angles, but you're always very focused on this Mekong Delta. Um, you know, which I could argue that Singapore, I don't think we have a focus. You know, we're, we're kind of like, yeah, we're well, great. I mean, the government's going to take care David, of everything. What, what is it to worry? What, <laughs> what do you see? I, I, I would say sea level rise would be the probably the, the, okay. the sea level rise would probably be the single biggest focus here because it's probably still the biggest existential threat for Singapore. Um, it's very hard for any country to hold back the tide, as it were, um, and all of Singapore's money will, cannot cope with like a three or five meter sea level rise. Um, so that's why the government is is very focused on studying climate change uh, and the impacts around, um, or sea level rise impacts around the different parts of the... Okay. So, so, so I guess what you're saying is, in the case of Singapore as an example, it will be uh, sea level rise before we talk pollution, air pollution, for uh, instance, whereas no, in no, no, Thailand no. it might be yeah, different. I, I, think, I think the debate in Singapore is a little bit more evenly split between sea level rise flooding, surface flooding, and yeah. because there's been a lot of investment in drainage. Um, and then also um, the urban uh, heat island effect, yeah. uh, which uh, Matthias yeah. would know a lot more about than I would. Um, because you know, in terms of graining the city to try yeah. to help bring down some of those temperatures. Uh, in terms of air pollution, um, maybe a little less. But of course, they're trying to get rid of at least one portion of that, which is um, internal combustion engines. Um, they don't like to talk about the pollution that comes from the whole petrochemical complex. Um, that's so as a, as a panel then, there is then the agreement that, yeah, I, I think we're onto something. We have focus, right? Well, I think what, what is interesting for me to hear is that there's definitely a need to bring together different people who are concerned about climate change and work around this topic from different angles and the more there is this exchange and communication the the more there is impact in a way um, i want to take another question yes can i just ask my colleagues if there is any question from the people who are online no okay kathleen let's do it Hi. Um, I'm actually interested in the language that is used, you know, around in writing and, you know, anything in, in connected with the visuals. Um, was the word climate justice used the word you know, a lot, you know, connected with social justice when you do research? And how is that coming prominent, you know, in the stories that are coming through? The reason why I'm asking is because I did a, a, a small research for a performing arts network, and I interviewed a lot of artists, uh, performing arts artists, uh, on climate justice. And actually, they said that the word climate justice in Southeast Asia, and even also in Northeast Asia, was not used. So, you know, it's an interesting thing. What language are we using around it, you know? And is it also related with the political contexts we are actually in? Um, and maybe a second to the, um, it's more for the North Foundation. It's 
you know, that visibility and in which way is the NOR, uh, is NOR actually hooking in with other platforms like who are working on social justice or other places to make what they do more visible? So it's kind of, yeah, language and platforms. Who wants to, to address the first question? If not, we can ask Stefano maybe. Stefano, you want to take both questions? I, both, I don't think I can in terms of the language. Yeah, uh, the, yeah the climate not, justice, maybe you, the two of you would well, do. Uh, I am not even really sure I know what that means. Um, what is exactly that we mean with climate justice? Well, the, and uh, sorry, the, uh, maybe maybe let's let's ask first Ponita to to reply to this, and then we we ask you for the second one. I think what Kathleen was raising is that the the concept of climate justice, in terms of real terminology, is not really used in the context of Southeast Asia. I see. Yeah, yeah. than others, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, that's, I, I didn't think about that, and I'm glad you brought it up, because ultimately, you know, the people who are most disproportionately at risk are those in, like, a certain social, socioeconomic uh, class level um, in the case of Cambodia and as well as gender and so on and I just feel like the word justice is quite political and you cannot bring about uh, you cannot talk about climate justice without talking about political justice as well at least in the case of Cambodia so um, yeah I think that you know there has when you do bring about climate justice you also uh, kind of bring into question sort of activism as well and that's also not something that's necessarily uh, encouraged in our region, so yeah. And, uh, that, that's also one of the reasons why this this program has been pretty like questionable being in Vietnam because the name is is uh, climate crisis and we don't have crisis in Vietnam, you know. So that's the it's, it's, it's not getting really really <laughs> political. So that's why we have to tweak it for the for the Vietnamese version. So yeah, I I, I, I understand. I, I get the question, but then that's also the topic is not very well studied here in this region yet, you know. And that's what we are exploring. Yep. Stefano. Yes. Um, <laughs> No, thank you for the question. I, again, I wish I could give you a better, more comprehensive answer, but we are exploring and we are, we've been in a, in a phase of transition from how we behaved before and what we were before to what we are not yet and we would like to be soon. So we are not communicating very much. Um, I have to be very, very honest. There is a lot of work that we have done over the past 18, 24 months that has not found a way to be communicated yet for a number of reasons. We, we chose also to, to hold it for a little and understand how to, again, create the, the greatest impact. But one example I could uh, bring forward is that we recently finished a um, program similar to this one in form, but... Uh, uh, less focus on climate crisis, more on communities uh, within the cocoa, produce, uh, cocoa production communities of um, Cote d'Ivoire in Western Africa. And uh, the results of the workshop uh, um, are now, we're now pairing with WordPress Photo for an exhibition that will bring this work to Abidjan and uh, hopefully later on in Europe as well accompanying a larger a larger exhibition of uh, of the WordPress photo. So I think that that is the way in which uh, content such as this, which is not always easy to 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 use. Uh, not everybody wants to see it, not many people want to buy. It. So we have to find ways wherein we really construct something quite powerful, like a whole exhibition made of uh, several other programs. Uh, so this is uh, the WordPress photo partnership is one way in which we, we, we choose a larger organization uh, or vice versa, they chose us to, to work together and spread and spread the results of a program or, or, uh, or um, uh, work on a topic. Uh, we haven't yet uh, collaborated with other um, platforms on this specific uh, subject. In the past, uh, in, the, in, the, in the almost 20 years of, uh, of NUR existence, I think that there were a number of, uh, uh, you know, like the photography is always uh, 
it's not difficult to find place for photography to play a role in other in other organizations uh, agendas or schedules so i think that yes i can't answer that straight because we don't have at the moment such partnerships but we we were working for for that we are preparing our communication so that when we start communicating we don't stop for a while we have uh, plenty of work that will keep us going for for actually for a couple of years so we, that it was a moment for us to really gather the work and make sure that what we understand what we're doing which uh, to finish brings me back to the previous question on the focus which I also think is fundamental and that was our decision to you know we we, we worked in conflict in uh, human rights abuses uh, migration uh, social justice uh, democracy and so on and so forth and we still do that. We're still supporting work of a variety, an array of subjects that is quite broad. However, we had to choose, we had to face the fact that at the moment, we feel that the, the climate crisis is, is, the why, is, is the most important and collects many other issues. So focusing in our educational program on this uh, specific theme, and then in some programs, we even narrow it more down for example, at the moment, we are focusing in um, Cote d'Ivoire on uh, regenerative agriculture uh, practices, which uh, it's, it's an even narrower uh, field. We're focusing more because it is fundamental to speak about this, which first of all can be a positive approach to the narrative around climate crisis, which we miss in the media or we have very little compared to the doom and gloom and apocalyptic uh, provisions, which are true and fair to share, but uh, have often the effect of paralyzing us. And, uh, and it's crucial in, uh, in, a, in a country, Ivory Coast, where uh, it's the, one of the biggest producers of food for the largest uh, growing population in the, uh, in the world. So I think that I agree with that need for focus. We need to choose what we talk about. And often it's not about what we like to talk about, but what is the most important issue that we have to address right now. And um, hence the collaboration with scientists and media and schools, education, it's fundamental to, to maximize impact and outcome. Thank you, Stefano. I think we are reaching the end of the conversation, but maybe one last question. <laughs> maybe two, okay, two, I don't want <laughs> please. No, I just have a question about photography and truth telling in the age of AI. Um, <laughs> AI I know is something that is threatening a lot of artists, especially photographers, and um, you talked about a photo being a photo and telling what it is. So just, just curious of what all of you think of that. Let's take two questions. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm Shirlene. Uh, I'm Filipino, but I'm studying in Singapore. And uh, my question is actually for Panita, because uh, I'm doing my PhD in, in RSIS, and my PhD is in uh, uh, feminist international relations. And uh, uh, well, my research, and also I'm, I'm a photographer as well, so um, uh, a lot of my work resonates with, uh, with your work, but I haven't seen uh, the whole you know, picture, but I'm really excited to see that. But my question is, um, uh, um, not everybody, uh, well, in my field, politics and international relations, not everybody is a fan of looking at the world at a gendered perspective. You know, when you look at um, human rights, wars, conflicts, and all these things, um, not everyone um, uh, finds value in looking at the nuances of the experiences of men and women and, and how they are affected by these kinds of things. So my question is that, uh, from your experience um, um, doing the project in Cambodia, uh, what do you think is the overarching, like, um, theme of, of the women's experience, at least in your country, or maybe if you have done any projects outside Cambodia in, in, in the region or in any country, what do you think uh, is the like um, gender-specific, like overarching experiences of women, um, not only in climate change, but also in other maybe social, uh, social political or social economic issues? Um, sure. Oh, um, someone should answer the AI one now. No, 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 let's, let's first... Ah, okay. Go okay, with okay. this, and then the sure. AI question is for um, everyone. Okay, so that, uh, that's a, quite a loaded question, um, to be honest. Um, I cannot speak for all women. Uh, I, I, I can't. 
But I do feel like, at least in Cambodia, I mean, traditional gender roles do play a big part of it. Um, the reason why women are disproportionately at risk is because of traditional gender roles, from what I've read. Um, and having done, you know, spent all that time and so on uh, with, you know, this group, like basically they're, they're sisters, that's essentially um, the premise. Uh, having spent time with them, you know, talking about, you know, their lives and so on, it makes sense. They, their concerns, their mothers, right? They're like, they're thinking about, you know, the future of their children. They're thinking about, oh, I need to do this. I need to go home and, and uh, cook the meal for the family. So two of them are married. One of them talked about how, oh, I'm not married. I've seen what, you know, how difficult it can be. I need to look after the family. I need to look after my mother. So that responsibility rests often rest on the shoulders of women, at least in the rural context. In the city, perhaps it's a bit different. So I would say, you know, it really depends on the region and the socioeconomic uh, circumstance as well. And, and I think, yeah, I, I don't know if that really answers it. And in terms of people not liking to look at things from a gendered perspective, yeah, I, I, I was told that when I approached the, the project. That's why, you know, in the text and in the focus, I they just happen to be women. Like, this is like three sisters and so on. I wanted to understand what it was like. And, and through it, I would bring in, you know, some of the things that I discovered and how I relate to them as, you know, a woman, even though I'm from a completely different sort of, I'm from the city, I'm more privileged and so on. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's how you word things, perhaps. Um, if you want things to resonate, I guess, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll just stay with you, Ponita, for the AI-related question. If I can ask the three of you, maybe, unless Matthias and David and Stefan also want to say something about it. Uh, but maybe we start with you, Ponita. What's your, what's your view on it? Is it a threat? Is, are you embracing it? I think that's <laughs> a bit the... <laughs> I mean, it's there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's among there. us. It's, it's very there. clear. And I yeah. think for photographer, it's... Uh, um, uh, for me, you know, uh, when I create the work, I, it's very reliant on human to human, uh, relationship, right? So A, I can't do that. Uh, but I do feel like in terms of truth, you mentioned that as well. I know that I, in photography or the way that I do things, it's, it's an interpretation, as I mentioned. So it's never really accurate. It's not objective. It's most objective. And, you know, we all know that. Um, is it a threat? Maybe. I hope not. I, it's, it's diff I can't answer that, ultimately. I think, um, yeah, I'm just ignoring it for the time being. <laughs> to Chitra be honest. Bon, yeah. what about you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah. Um, AI has been, like, helping humans in this era. Um, well, even though the camera right now has AI, like, to help, like, focus and all that, like, yeah, it gives convenience, but um, in terms, like, Capturing the truth, I mean, I don't think it can replace photographers. Um, yeah. So it can be useful, but in, at the end uh, of the it day, it can help humans, it's but just, yeah. not the truth. Yeah. Lynn, do you have, I'm sure you have oh. an opinion. <laughs> well, that's, that's too big of a question, you know. We, we need a festival for this. <laughs> But uh, thank you very much for the questions. So me, as a photography practitioner, I do photography to to redo my assumption about the war, you know. And 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 and, and that's to the point that I just feel like there was a period of time that we start getting to have the internet. That's when we feel like we know everything, but actually we don't. And 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 especially in this region, it has been proven to me times after time. You know, this is. The reason that it's not that very well studied in in in, in many ways, and and as I mentioned earlier, that that uh, you know like we people on the ground, you know we 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 take reference, we we start reading those uh, scientific paper to have an understanding about the, the 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 situation. But but once we we out there, you know things are so different. That's when we start facing with a lot of other type of information, folk knowledge, you know, folk story. We start having to use our sensory. We start having to get that kind of like like feeling. Start having to have that real observation. So I think I think I think and and, and I do believe that we need more and more well-trained professional photographer or like storyteller or like reporter out there to be the witness and and and, and to tell people and then to to generate that content for the people to to learn from you know to study from. And so I I, I strongly believe 
in the role of, of you know reporter and photographer and and, and 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 people you know like doing the ground work out there they they still like so crucial at, 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 at this point when 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 you have a lot of like you know like fake news and then this and that out there so i think the the role is just more and more and more important you know for for those well trained professionals to be out there yeah. david maybe you want to say something about this to know too much <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Stefano, one last thought before yeah. we wrap up. Well, yeah. Maybe yeah, from AI. the point of view of an organization who's trying to, you know, educate also and, and from yeah, an organization <laughs> point of view, what is what is happening with AI? Are you are you even We are worried I about mean AI it? Yeah, yeah, it's no. I'm not worried. I mean, I think uh, it is. It is uh, possible that it will wipe out humanity uh, in a number of ways. Yes, it's a threat in that. But uh, the threat is not AI. The th the worst threat for humans are humans. I mean, that's 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 that and uh, intentions. So the the interests behind uh, AI are not all um, uh, good so AI is fantastic an incredible thing and far far greater than what we know um, publicly so in terms of uh, production of images or reproduction of images uh, it's uh, far beyond our understanding and uh, it is not human yet uh, it does not have uh, certain human capacities yet uh, but i you know like manipulation is as old as humanity so it's nothing new. Manipulation of truth uh, is, is all this uh, our language system. So we we I'm not I don't think that that's the real threat. And um, and lastly, I mean every innovation has been welcomed by the practitioners as a potential threat to their existence. I mean painters uh, were looking at photography in a in a very you know not very nice way. And similar uh, similar the digital uh, revolution when photography went from analog to digital. Uh, they were people were looking at digital photography with with some skepticism, but that's that's gone. Um, we now are used to it. This, we, now we had another further revolution, which was uh, photography went on the phones. We can, you know, but this is different things. Photography, analog photography is one thing. Digital photography is another thing. Mobile uh, photography is another thing. AI is another thing. AI generated images is another thing. That none of these is uh, is uh, is um, a protector of truth, uh, because there is always a human being behind. Even with AI, there are there have been there are humans behind it feeding it, and uh, there will be for a while still human running humans running it. So the manipulation happens at the human level at this stage. Um, that's scary more than AI. I think, and as an organization, what we are trying to do is trying to understand what is our role within it. Shall we speak about it? Shall we raise concerns? Shall we address it? Shall, well, and I believe that firstly we need to understand a little bit what it is that we're talking about, which is not easy because this is a huge uh, undertake. And uh, uh, how to address it? And you know, the, the answer I think is always uh, similar for me. It's uh, we, well, we we need to educate ourselves and. This forces us to, rem to remember what it is that sets us apart, what it is that makes us human, what is that, that a machine cannot do with photography, for example. And that will uh, create better work. Thank you, Stefan. I think it's, it's nice because we want to end on a positive note. And I think your words and the words of all our speakers tonight, I, I really feel that they give us some hope in terms of, you know, trying to all work together towards the better good of all of us. Climate crisis is a fact, it's among us, but as long as we'll have people involved in it who are actively working around it and trying to document it, and as long as we are all humans talking to each other, I think there is a hope for all of us. So with this, I think we're going to end this evening panel. And I want to really thank all of you, uh, David, Matthias, Ponita, Jitterpong, Lynn, and Stefano for taking part. And for all of you who came here and all our, our guests who are online, thank you for joining. And good night. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.